Our first reading comes from Luke chapter 15. Jesus is in Jerusalem teaching to a large but very mixed audience which included Pharisees and tax collectors. He has told them the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. We pick up the narrative in verse 12 of chapter 15. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could cel celebrate with my friends. And when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Morning everyone. Uh, Galatians 3, uh, through to 4. Children of God. Before the come, sorry, we're starting at verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time is set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because we are his sons. 
God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer called a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Morning, everyone. Lovely to see you all. Um, as, you, as Dane mentioned earlier, um, although we've got no kids program on today, there are some activity sheets at the back there. So if, if any of the kids are around and they haven't got theirs yet, you might like to go up and grab it. Um, next to that, there's also adults activity sheets. So if you get bored during the sermon, you can run back and get those. That will be fine too. That's actually a complete lie. There isn't anything for the adults. I'm going to pray and then we're going to look at God's word together. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for all the wonderful things you give us. Uh, we thank you particularly for Christmas time and for all the joy um, that we, we get um, celebrating together. We pray, Lord, that today, as we look again at your word, that you would encourage us, uh, strengthen us, so that we might understand a little bit more about what Christmas is about for you and for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Christmas is a time of family, isn't it? Um, that's one of the things that when people say, what's the most important thing about Christmas for you? For most people, it's family. Um, and that idea of family is really significant. That's what I'm going to think about that today. But it's one of those things that actually comes back again and again um, when, when you think about different movies and things and different books. So, for instance, um, you may rec recognise this fellow, um, Harry Potter, of course. Um, obviously, there's lots of things going on in the Harry Potter series. But one of the exciting things, I guess, about that is that Harry... You know, he has a kind of muggle family who don't treat him very well. He lives under the stairs and all of that. And then he, when he gets to Hogwarts, he finds his true family, what it really means to really find somewhere to belong. If we go back a little bit further, one of the movies that was off, that's often played at Christmas time is this one. Anyone recognise that one? Sound of Music. Um, and so you may remember that's them on stage together. Uh, Maria comes as a... Um, a nanny, and she's, she's, she kind of finds it hard to kind of fit into the family, but eventually she fits in. In fact, she becomes part of the family, and it's a, a real part of the movement of that movie. So, if, oh, sorry, spoilers if you haven't seen it. Um, she actually becomes part of the family. She marries the, 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 the lead guy. Um, and then, of course, a little bit further, I don't know if you can remember this movie. Does anyone recognise that one? Oliver. Okay, so Oliver is there. He's the one on the, on the right of the screen. And Oliver is a, an orphan living in the streets of London, and he's kind of lonely, and he's got nowhere to go. And he meets this guy, the guy with the top hat, whose name is the Artful Dodger. Uh, and the Artful Dodger is a really, very streetwise kind of kid, and he sings a song to him, which is really, like, as, as a kind of orphan in the, in the streets of London, would have been really exciting to him. Because anybody remember what the song is that the Artful Dodger sings to Oliver? Consider yourself at home. Consider yourself part of the family. Exactly. And so we should have done. We should have done that. Be cool. um, we'll show your age, aren't we? Old decrepit ones. Um, but it would be an exciting thing for Oliver, wouldn't it? Who um, lives on the streets. He's got nowhere to go, and finally he finds himself a family. This is a bit of a dysfunctional family, as to be said. Um, but at least he's got somewhere to belong. And Christmas is a lot about that. However, although people say Christmas is a time for family, for some people it's actually a difficult time, particularly because of family. Uh, family is not always a good place to be. It can actually be a place of great pain um, because of present and, and past hurts. It can also be a time of sadness because of the family that we once had that we don't have anymore. Maybe people have moved away or perhaps even people have died. Um, so Christmas can actually be quite a bittersweet kind of time for a lot of people. Um, and so one, one of the things I want to think about today is if it is really about family, does the, does the Bible, does Christmas have anything to say to encourage us as we think about that idea of family? So I think it does. And we're going to look to the, the book, uh, book of Galatians. So if you've got a Bible, you might like to open to Galatians chapter 3, 3 and 4. And Paul is going to talk a little bit about um, the whole idea of family, but before he does, he helps. We, we actually need to understand where we've come from, where we were. And so, in chapter four, verse three, Paul says that we were in slavery under the basic principles or the spiritual forces of this world. Paul says that originally we were slaves. Now, you may not recognise yourself as a slave, but Paul says that all of us were. 
What does he mean by that? Well, he doesn't actually explain it here, but he does explain it in other places. So in Romans chapter four, uh, Romans chapter sixteen, sorry, sorry, Romans chapter six, verse seventeen, Paul says that we are actually slaves to sin. We were slaves to sin. Um, I know our world talks a lot about freedom, that we can be free to do whatever we want at any old time. We can do, uh, nobody can tell me what to do. Nobody's going to impose their rules on me. I am free. However, I don't know if you've noticed that for many people, that as they live a life of freedom, that actually it ends up in slavery. And so although we chase after and seek after the things that, that we want to do, the things that we think are right, it can end, often end up in slavery. So, for instance, um, people, when, when you chase after an experience or a feeling, when you do that, quite often when you get it, you don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite match up. I remember reading um, uh, the autobiography of a guy by the name of Craig Johnson. Craig Johnson was an Australian footballer who played for Liverpool and uh, he was one of, one of the first Australians who kind of made it overseas. And he scored the winning goal for Liverpool in the FA Cup final. It was a big deal. Uh, and uh, there's, there's a scene at the beginning of the book where he's, he's sitting, uh, after, after he scored that goal, he's sitting in the lift as going up to the floor of his hotel room and the, uh, the coach walks in, uh, or gets into the lift with him. And he's kind of sitting there and he's going, is, is this all it is? And the guy says, mate, yeah, you better enjoy it. This is as good as it gets. And so for Craig, he kind of thought, well, I, I've been chasing after this my whole life, but is it really, does it really match up? Does it really necessarily satisfy? And actually, that's one of the things that is, is our common experience. Sometimes we chase after things. I wonder if you've ever bought yourself a new phone, like a new why, why is it that Apple put out a new, a new iPhone every year? It's because there's a huge hype, and everyone goes, oh, I've got to get the new iPhone, I get it, and I'm like, fantastic, this new iPhone. And in the end, it's just a phone. Um, and then I've got to wait for the next hype to go, well, oh, I've got to get this next phone, it does these other things. I get that, and oh, it's just a phone too. Or maybe you've uh, had the experience where you've gone on holiday. Love going on holidays, fantastic. But holidays always end. And when you come back from holiday, how do you feel? What are you thinking? Oh, allows you to be home. When's the next one, right? Where am I going to go next? Because although we, we experience all these things, we chase after all these things, they never quite satisfy us. In, many, in fact, in many ways, it's like slavery. We cannot get enough. And so, you, of course, one of the, the, the consequences sometimes of chasing after those things is you actually get enslaved to them. And so, of course, there's things like drugs and alcohol, but also adrenaline can be something that we chase after and we've got to get more and more and more. Um, that's what pornography does. That's what gambling does for us. It kind of ends up giving us this thing that we've got to keep on chasing. We actually become slaves to the things that we thought made us so free. Um, but also that whole idea of popularity and fame is another thing that we chase after um, and we work for and we get this, we might get there, but even then we've got to then work really hard to keep it. And so you might have your 15 minutes of fame, but then as you drift off into the, into the sunset, you kind of go, well, now what? Now what do I chase after? The things that our world puts before us as the, the ultimate things for us actually end up enslaving us. That's what Paul, I think, describes as being a slave to sin. And even in his own life, Paul says, I've, I try to get rid of this sin. And so the next chapter of the Bible, Romans chapter 7, um, Romans chapter 7, verse 24, I know you guys memorised that earlier in the year, so I won't even bother testing because I know you know it. Romans chapter 7, verse 24, Paul says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? He says, I've, I've tried to get rid of these things. I, I know the good things I should do, but I just can't do them. Paul recognised that he's a slave in his life. And maybe you felt that. But the other kind of slavery I think Paul's got in mind in this passage um, is that we can become slaves to the law, to rules and regulations. It's really what religion does for you. Religions love to make rules. They love to have all sorts of different rules and regulations that you have to follow. Um, and, and so whichever religion you choose of the, of, the, of the major world religions, they've got a whole list of rules. Um, there's the Eightfold Path of Buddhism. There's the Five Pillars of Islam. There's the Ten Commandments. I guess it's how many you want. It's, you pick the religion you want. There's so many rules. But although there's these five, ten, eight, um, even then, there's other rules that kind of sneak in. 
And so we, we've looked a little bit at the book, books of Leviticus recently in the Old Testament. And although you've got the Ten Commandments, there's all this other stuff that you've got that goes along with it. And so it just keeps on going. And so we can actually end up being slaves to try and be good. And I think it's one of the things that Paul's talking about when he talks about being slaves, that we are slaves, that we, we try to achieve goodness, but we can't do it because there's always more rules. And then I find even when I know the rules, even then I muck it up. Don't you? We fight so hard to do what is right. And so we are, it's like we are slaves. So Paul says that's where we were, but that's not where we are. And so in chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, he goes on to say, At just the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us from slavery. He's talking about Christmas, when God sent his son, born of a woman. He's talking about Christmas night. Right? What's so exciting about Why did he come? Well, he's come to redeem us from slavery. That's what we heard last week, you may remember. We've been looking, for those of you who have visited us here today, it's great to have you with us. Um, but you actually missed out the first couple of talks. We've been looking about Christmas. And what does the Bible say? What's the significance of it? And last week we saw actually that the most significant thing, the most important thing about Christmas is that God sent his son to die. That actually the Christmas story is the beginning of the story. The beginning of a story that actually finishes when Christ dies on the cross. And so Christmas, we re recognise that God sends Jesus to save us, to redeem us from slavery, to, to buy us back so that we're not slaves anymore. So that's what God's done for us. But he doesn't just save us and then kick us out in the street and go, off you go, you go and do, go, go, good luck, you know, I've saved you now, you're redeemed from slavery, off you go. He actually goes on, the next thing he says is, so that we might receive the full rights as sons that we might become not slaves, but children of God. And that's what I want you to think about for a moment. What does it mean to be a child of God? That's what Christmas does. God, The Son of God becomes a human so that humans can become children of God. That's what Christmas is about. And so there are three things he says about that. St. Anglican sermon has got to have three things. So... The first thing he says about what that's important is that we actually have God in us. How do you know that you're family? Well, you know it by the, the traits that you have. You know, I've got my father's hair or my, my, my mother's sense of humour or whatever it might be. Uh, my brother's big nose. You know, that, that we've, got, we've got those kind of things that run in our family. Um, and you know, so for us, it's the DNA. It's the things that, that our parents pass down to us that show we're part of the family. Well, of course, we're not going to get God's DNA, but we've got something so much better. Rather than having God's DNA, we actually have God himself in us. That's what he says, that God uh, comes to live in us by his Holy Spirit. And so now, because God lives in us, wherever we are, like we don't have to be in church to be with God. You can be down on the beach, you can be uh, trekking through the wilderness, you can be wherever you are, wherever you, are. you can be at work, be at school, uh, be at home, wherever you are, God is with you because with you God is in you. That's one of the amazing things. And so now, because God's in us, we can, actually be called, we can actually call God our Father. We can call God Abba, which is not just a 70s kind of glam rock band. It's, it, it's a Hebrew word that means uh, Dad. We can actually call God Dad which is incredible, don't you think? That the creator of all the universe calls you a child. That's astounding. And how, how good is it, that, how, how good does he find us being part of his family? That's that first passage we had read, that Susan read for us, um, the prodigal son. You've heard that story before. Uh, many of you will have heard that story before. But in that story, there's this great scene of it, but there's a great scene where the father is there and the, the, his son has run away. And spent all this money. Now, I don't know if, you, if your child's ever done that to you, not a good thing, right? Um, and he's gone off and he's, he's spent all this money on wild living and the father is just left there, no word, no, he just had no idea what's going on, except he knows all of his, his bank accounts going like this. And he realises he's, he's hanging out for his son to come back, but then he sees him in the distance. And unlike us, who might go up there and, and go... Shake our fist at him. He runs up to his son and throws his arms around him. He's so excited to have him home. 
That's how God feels about you. That's how precious you are to him. In fact, the two stories before about the, um, the, the lost coin and the lost sheep um, are about the fact that there's, it, it suggests that actually God throws a party. That's how excited God is to have you in his family. So at Christmas time, one, one of the most important things for us to realise is that we have God in us and that we now belong. It doesn't matter if you've got the worst family in the world, you actually now have the best family in the world, in the universe, because you are in God's family. First thing to remember, uh, that we have God in us. The second thing is that we are God's family together. I'm going to read to you the first couple of verses that um, Jen read for us from Galatians 3 and see if you notice how many times he says the word all. So he says in verse 26, you are, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptised into Christ, or who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ Jesus. So as you come to him, you actually are welcomed into a bigger family. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. There's no distinction, male or female, um, no matter what the colour of your skin, whether you're rich or you're poor, whether you're an adult or you're a child, uh, whether you're a New South Welsh person or a Queenslander even. Um, God welcomes all people, even those outrageous people. We are all family together. In fact, wherever you go in the world, you can find people in your family, which is amazing, isn't it? That we are not just welcomed as saved as, as Robinson Crusoe Christians, that wherever you go, God is there with his people. And we are part of that. Now, church is, is, by, church is, not, is never really perfect, right? Um, and I know our church here is not perfect. But when church do, works as it should, it should at the very least give us a taste of this. And I hope as you come here this morning, maybe as you hang around for morning tea after the service, that you get a little bit of a taste of what it's like to be part of a family. Even if you haven't got the, the best earthly family, that you are family here. You're amongst family. And so well, that's, one of the, that's one of the reasons it's so appropriate at Christmas for us to get together, isn't it? To celebrate, because we celebrate as family. So... Being God's children means that we have God in us, calling, that we can call God Dad. We are family together. But the last one is that we are actually heirs. He says in chapter 3, verse 29, chapter 4, verse 7, that we are heirs. There was something as it was being read, I don't know if it's uh, kind of stuck out to you, um, because certainly in our 21st century world it does to me, is that Paul constantly says that we are sons of God. Not just, not just children of God, he calls us sons of God. Which, you know, because we, we're PC, we know we, sons, and, sons and daughters, and we feel, we feel we should change it. But actually, Paul does that deliberately. He calls us sons of God because in the first century, in first century Judaism, it was the sons who were the heirs. And so the property, everything that the father owned, that was owned by the family, goes to the sons. And Paul's point here is not trying to say, well, men are better than women or anything like that. He's basically saying, in fact, he says, we're all one in Christ. There's no difference. But he says that all of us are like sons. We are all heirs. We will all receive the blessings that, that God has for us. Um, we, come, we all come as the same legal rights, if you like, before God. Um, now, of course, it, that doesn't mean that God's going to die one day and we're all going to become God um, in his place. But basically what it's saying is that we're actually going to receive the amazing promises that God has for us. And so a couple of weeks ago, you may remember... Dane spoke um, about the fact that God, Jesus reveals God to us um, and that during Advent, we look forward to the coming of Christ. Not the first coming, but the second coming. Because we, we're remembering this fact that we are heirs. We look forward to the, to the day where we will inherit all the stuff that you read in Revelations 21 and 22 about um, the tree of life that provides bountifully for everyone, the streams of living water, um, the place with no mourning or crying or pain. These things are absolutely awesome. Some of you will know that recently we had um, a, a foster child. Now, when you're a foster child, um, you don't have the same kind of legal rights um, or as a parent, you're, you're not um, legally responsible for the child. Actually, the state is responsible for the child. 
um, and they don't have the same kind of legal rights in your family. But that changes when you adopt them. They actually become fully part of your family. And that is what has happened to you. You, if you put your trust in Jesus, you are now part of God's family and an heir. You, to all the riches of heaven belong to you, which is amazing, don't you think? And Paul actually, as he thinks about that, says in Romans chapter 8, that all of the bad stuff we go through, the present sufferings, are not worth comparing to how glorious our, our future is. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking through the New Testament at some of the things that the, it t- says about what, why Christmas is so, spe- so special. And we've seen four things. I don't know if you can remember them. The first thing we saw was that Jesus, when Jesus is born, he, he is God's final revelation to us, his clearest revelation. He shows us what God is like. If you want to see God, look at Jesus. That's what we saw in the first one. Uh, The second week we saw from Philippians 2 that Jesus comes as a model, as an example for us to follow. So we should have the same attitude as him. So uh, when we we see Jesus being loving, we should be loving. We follow him. Then last week we saw, probably most significantly, that Jesus comes to save us, to rescue us, to redeem us, if you like, to buy us back, to give us freedom. And now today, as we think about Christmas, which is coming tomorrow, um, we actually realise that when Jesus comes, the Son of God becomes a human so that the sons of humans can become the sons and daughters of God. That's what Jesus has done for us. Christmas is about family. But it's not about our earthly families. It's about the fact that we can now be part of God's family. And so I hope this Christmas that that can fill you with amazing joy to realise that you belong and as, as we gather together and we celebrate that we belong together to our Lord. How about I pray that God would uh, fill us with this joy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that because of Jesus we are now family, that we belong to you and to each other. Thank you for the joy that that means that we can actually call you Dad, that we have this intimate relationship with you as our Heavenly Father. Um, it's not, we're not a, just a religion following rules and regulations, but we have relationship with the Lord of the universe. Thank you also, Lord, that we are together and we pray that this family may become a bit of a taste of what it means to be in your family. And finally, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to hold on to the amazing joy of the hope that we have and we look forward to receiving our inheritance when Jesus returns and say, Lord Jesus, we pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.